This was a political summer like nothing we've ever seen. What we're seeing here are events that maybe not have happened since 1824, 1884, and we gotta figure out how to decipher that for our clients and for investors. So we're headed for a close race in the presidential race, we're headed for a close race in the congressional races. I don't have the luxury of telling my clients it's gonna be close. I don't really have any idea what's gonna happen. We have to figure out our ways around it. And what we did at Strategus is that we built a framework to better understand what's happening in the election. It's three parts. The first, we ask, is this a referendum on the Biden-Harris administration? or is it a choice between Harris and Trump? It is the single most important question. The second is the economic variables that have determined the election. And then third, what really matters is what's happening in the swing states. And so let me answer that first question. Is it a referendum on the Biden-Harris administration or is it a choice between Harris and Trump? Well, Biden gets out of the race and don't you know his approval rating goes up? Poof, okay? Like, people just didn't want him to be president. And what we learned from that is that Biden was not liked because of competency and acuity more than anything else. And that's important because when you talk to the Trump campaign, they were like, well, we're just replacing one really unpopular president with another unpopular vice president. We're gonna be okay. And what happened was as soon as Biden got out, you saw Harris's approval rating starting to go up. They essentially made the race a choice. And so right now, until something changes, this race is a choice. And if there's a takeaway from that, there's probably gonna be a debate, another debate in mid-October, even though Trump is saying no debate at this point. The second are the economic variables that determine the election. We found that if you add up inflation rate and the unemployment rate, it predicted 15 of the past 16 presidential election winners and every winner since 1980. Okay? This is called the misery index. It's from the Jimmy Carter era. And our, our whole theory is if misery is higher year over year, the incumbent party loses. And if misery is lower year over year, the incumbent party wins. Think about the 50-50 country that we're in right now. Of course, the misery index is right on the 50-50 line. So we know exactly what number that's got to be. It's got to be 7.35%. If it's higher, Trump wins. If it's lower, Harris wins. It's like 7.05, three-tenths of 1%. It has never been this close going into a presidential election before. What it is telling us is that gasoline prices are coming down very significantly and inflation is now coming down, at least temporarily, faster than unemployment's higher. This is one of the reasons why Harris is still in the race and why Trump is having trouble being executing his argument. So, choice election, 50-50 on the economic variables, we start looking at stocks. And what we found is that the S&P 500 has predicted 20 of the past 24 presidential election winners. Not perfect, 83%. Stocks are higher, the incumbent party wins on election day in the final 90 days. Stocks are lower, it goes the other way. We do this with the dollar. We add them all together and then we come up with a forecast for where they are. And literally, outside stocks, all of it is at 50-50 right now. So something's gotta break here. And that means that the decider is what happens in the swing states. From November of last year until June of this year, Trump had been winning overwhelmingly in the swing states. And by the way, Trump had never been winning at all in 2016 when he won the election. So this is all strange for us. And what you saw was as soon as Harris got in, that swing state lead collapsed. Right now, it's about even. There's about a two-point swing in the polls for Trump. And so we still think he's ahead in the swing states but every day that number is getting less and less after the debate itself. One of the key things here is that what happened around uh, August 23rd, August 24th, RFK endorsed Trump, and most of the media said, ah, it's not a big deal. And we looked at it and we were like, this is huge. Because if you look at the five-person polling, Trump was losing, and then you look at the two-person polling, Trump's winning, which means RFK was taking more votes away from Trump than he was taking away from Harris. And don't you know 
that Trump has now improved in all of the swing states since that happened. What I tried to do here is just show you a table that if you apply the polling error that was on Trump's numbers in 2020, he would win every single swing state, even in the polls that he's losing right now. If you apply the polling error of 2022, Trump would lose almost every swing state. And so nobody really knows if it's 2022, 2020, or something different, but we're probably sitting somewhere in between those two right now. And if that wasn't confusing enough, we're about to have a very divided House of Representatives and very divided Senate. What we are seeing in the data is that the Republicans are very likely to take over the Senate come November. There is a real chance that the Democrats take the House from the Republicans and the Republicans take the Senate from the Democrats. The historical significance of this is incredible. It has never happened in the modern US political system and it's extremely likely what's gonna happen. And the Democrats are gonna end up with like a five or six seat majority. Republicans are gonna end up with a one or two seat majority in the Senate. It's almost like the collective wisdom of Americans is saying, we're not giving you a mandate. We're gonna put you in a room and you're gonna to have to figure out the debt ceiling and you're gonna to have to figure out all of the tax cuts itself. And so I think that Americans are giving this mandate to Congress and they will settle it it will just be a little bit ro ro rocky in terms of how they settle it. The election is really the precursor to reorganizing what the US tax code will be at the end of 2025. I believe that next year will be more important for tax policy than any other year other than 1913 when we created the income tax. We have $4 trillion of tax cuts that are expiring at the end of 2025 that need to be extended. We have a fiscal situation that has a $2 trillion deficit in a bond market that will not just let Congress extend all these tax cuts. So what does that mean? All income tax rates go up. Has anybody ever heard of the alternative minimum tax? That thing comes raging back, okay? The standard deduction gets cut in half. The child tax credit gets cut in half. The estate tax exemption right now is over 16 million, and it will go down to about 6 million, or 13 million, it will go down to about 6 million, okay? So it is a Super Bowl of tax policy, and both candidates have plans for how they're gonna resolve it, and they could impact you individually. People say, well, Dan, that's like 14 months from now. Wake me up when I get there. I gotta tell you, I've been through this in 2012, and when we got into early 2012, mid-2012, there was such a demand for services on planning that you couldn't get appraisers to appraise your value. So if you are not meeting with your Baird advisor now, if you have planning issues, now's the time to do it. You don't have to make any decisions. You just wanna make sure that all of your paperwork and all of your planning is in order in case Congress screws this up. Now, I don't think Congress is gonna screw this up. Okay, but man, placing your faith in a divided government, a 50-50 Congress, I'm not really sure that that's the best thing. So our motto is be prepared and work with your Baird advisor to be able to get situated for that. The last point that I'll make to you is that there is a lot of polarization in this country. I mean, we just had a presidential candidate get shot at twice. Okay, this is like really dangerous. But what I'm seeing on the ground in Washington is more and more cooperation between progressives and conservatives, particularly on foreign affairs issues. China is beginning to rally our country and starting to define what our common interest was. You go back to that Berlin Wall example. When I grew up, we fought over the Yankees and the Mets. We fought over taxes and abortion, but we were always fighting for something larger globally. When the Berlin Wall went down, we didn't really have anything to fight over anymore okay, on, on a global scale. So Democrats and Republicans became the main opponent. The more and more China challenges the US, the more and more you're starting to see this unity happening amongst the left and the right about making sure that development is here in America, making sure America's national security is very, very, very um, prepared for any of these types of activities. And I'm more bullish on America today than I've ever been despite all of this polarization, 
despite the next 49 days being absolutely crazy out of our minds, the longer term trajectory is the right one. And I'm confident the American economy will still be the greatest economy in the world five, 10, and 20 years from now.